Hey, I want to tell you real quick why it is that the Schrodinger equation is not compatible with special relativity. The reason I want to tell you this is that in part two of the hydrogen video, we saw that the Schrodinger equation can give us a really good idea of what's going on inside of a hydrogen atom. But the Schrodinger equation is not actually 100% true. It's a non-relativistic approximation. And in hydrogen part three, we're going to see what happens when we take the relativistic effects into account. But the really cool thing is that when you take relativity into account, it's not just that you get a slightly more precise number, but actually the ideas of relativity open up a whole new world of spin and antimatter and really trippy geometry. So today I want to take as the starting point the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom that we derived in hydrogen part one. And now the question I want to ask is, okay, well that's for hydrogen, but what about for a free electron that's not bound to a proton? In fact, imagine the proton's not even part of the story anymore, okay? It's just an electron. Well, to get that, all we have to do is delete the electrostatic potential term in the equation. So that e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r times psi, just delete that. And the electron will be released from the grip of the proton. When you do that, you end up with the Schrodinger equation for a free particle, and notice now there's no charge term anymore, so it doesn't really matter that it's an electron. Uh, could be any particle. Anyway, if you look at this equation, you see that there's a Laplacian and it's proportional to a time derivative, and so if you've worked with vector calculus before, you'll recognize this as a wave equation, where the more pinched or the more scrunched together the wave function is, the faster it's changing there, and the more flat the wave function is, the more kind of just uniform and not super pinched, well, the less it's changing over there. Now, right from the start, I want to tell you why this equation is relativistically problematic. If you look at the Laplacian, that's a second order derivative. But now if you look at the time derivative, it's first order. And so in the same equation, we have a derivative that's second order in space and a derivative that's first order in time. And that doesn't really mesh well with the fundamental ideas in special relativity in which space and time are unified into this three plus one dimensional Minkowski space time. And long story short, because of Lorenz boosts and the fact that different observers might take different slices through that space-time depending on how fast they're going and where they are, you really don't want to have an equation where space and time are of a different order. Because the Lorenz transform is going to mix your space and your time together and then it's just kind of, it's just going to break the equation. So I know that's a bit of an abstract point, but I just want to say right from the start you look at the Schrodinger equation and you say, oh yeah, that's not relativistic. All right, but we want to get more specific insight here. So in order to be more specific, let me introduce the plane wave solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Today we're going to use the plane waves to explore how the Schrodinger equation behaves at a variety of different velocities so that we can see that in the relativistic limit the equation does not match experiment and also has some theoretical issues as well. One thing I should say about these plane waves is that these are momentum and energy eigenstates. So these correspond to particles whose momentum is precisely known, but as a result, you know, in quantum mechanics, you know the momentum, you don't know the position. So as a result, these plane waves go across all of space. Now, you can think of that in two ways. First of all, it's an idealization. In reality, you never perfectly know the momentum. But also, you can think about these plane waves like we're pretty zoomed in on the particle. So let's say you have some experiment and you're firing electrons with some momentum that's pretty well known and then you're zoomed in on the region of interest in the experiment where the electron beam is pointing. Well, at that point you might as well model it as plane waves, even though if you were to zoom out and look at the laboratory and your experimental apparatus in context, it's not just a plane wave that goes on forever. So anyway, you don't have to take these plane waves too literally. But also, the other thing is you can stack these Fourier style. So let's say you don't precisely know the momentum, but maybe the momentum is some Gaussian thing. So for example, let's say you have a particle at rest, and you think it's at rest, but you're not exactly sure, maybe it has a little bit of momentum. So here on the top left in the plot, I'm showing a Gaussian distribution of momentum. So now momentum's kind of a fuzzy thing, we don't know exactly what it is. And then on the right, I'm showing the time evolution of that particle, where over time it's going to kind of spread out. The wave function is going to become more and more diffuse, but to actually calculate that, all you have to do is stack a bunch of momentum eigenstates and integrate over this momentum space. And he well, here, so here's a one-dimensional view of that, just to make it a bit more concrete. And I'm not going to get into the math in depth today, but long story short, if you're familiar with Fourier analysis, you can imagine that these momentum plane waves let us translate between momentum space and space. So anyway, all that's to say by exploring the properties of these Schrodinger plane waves, we can get essential insight into the nature of the Schrodinger equation more generally in a variety of contexts. Let's go back to that picture of the electron beam in our lab. 
So what I'm showing here is a 10 keV electron. Now if you haven't heard about it before, what is a keV? keV is a kilo electron volt. So if you take an electron and you accelerate it down a voltage drop of 10,000 volts, 10 kilovolts, then the energy that it picks up, assuming it's in a vacuum chamber, will be 10 kilo electron volts. Actually, you know what? No, let's look at a 20 keV electron. <laughs> Whoa, hey, check it out. So as you go to higher electron momentum or higher kinetic energy, you see how the wavelength shrinks? So by the way, by exploring the plane wave solutions to the Schrodinger equation, you can derive the famous de Broglie relations about the wavelength versus momentum of an electron. That's very useful in electron diffraction, for example. By the way, normally when you're learning quantum mechanics, the de Broglie relations are taught to motivate the derivation of the momentum and energy operators. But that doesn't mean that the de Broglie relations are causally prior to the Schrodinger equation. It's more accurate to see them as two sides of the same coin. So, now what happens if we crank up our acceleration voltage and make some blazing fast 40 keV electrons? Well now we're going basically 40% the speed of light. By the way, that's easy to remember. 40 keV, 40% the speed of light. It only applies to electrons, but if you do a lot of electron diffraction or electron microscopy, that's just something to keep in mind. 40 keV, 40% the speed of light. Why does that matter? Well, because that's the point where, I mean, you can draw this line anywhere, but at some point you have to say, well, when is the electron going so fast that we need to think about relativity? And of course that depends on how precise you want to be. But by the time you get around 40% the speed of light, it does beg the question of, hey, are we still in the non-relativistic limit here? Or like, what's, what's going on? Do we need to worry about our Lorenz factor? Because look, there's a difference between relativistic physics and non-relativistic physics when it comes to the energy versus velocity equation. So let's take a look at this chart. There's a lot going on, so we'll look at it one piece at a time. Uh, but what I'm showing along the x-axis is the speed of the electron as a fraction of the speed of light. This is called that beta factor, by the way, in relativity, we call it beta. So zero is at rest and one is the speed of light. 0 0.4 is 40% the speed of light. On the y-axis, I'm showing the energy of the electrons in keV. Now I have here on the y label, not including mc squared. That only matters for the relativistic equation. In the relativistic equation, the electron still has energy even when it's at rest. It's the energy mc squared but I've subtracted out that rest mass term so we can get a better comparison as far as what is the actual difference between what relativistic physics versus non-relativistic physics predicts as far as the energy versus velocity curve. Now, I've put a few things in here for a sense of perspective. So first, if we look at the vertical line on the far left side of this plot, you can see that speed corresponds to 10,000 kilometers per second. That's very fast, okay? In one second, go 10,000 kilometers, you're going extremely fast. And if you look at the two curves to the left of that line, they're identical. They're both on top of each other. There's really no difference between relativistic physics and non-relativistic physics. And Newtonian physics works just fine. If you want to build a car, if you want to build a bridge, if you want to build a house, it's all good. But if you want to drive the car across the bridge to your house and then stay up late at night wondering about the nature of things, well, that's when relativity comes in. So you know, back in the old Nintendo days, we had the big fat TVs with the cathode ray tubes. And what those are is basically an electron beam. And the electrons inside the old TVs are typically about 25 keVs. So I just put that there for a sense of perspective and to show you that, you know, with pretty relatively everyday technology, you can get pretty fast electrons. You can actually go pretty far out on this curve with just everyday technology. If you look at the purple rectangle in this plot, I'm showing you the typical energy range of a scanning electron microscope electron. Those are typically in the range of 1 to 50 keVs. For the most part, when you're working in an electron microscope, an SEM that is, TEMs are different, but SEM, typically the electrons can basically be treated as non-relativistic. I mean, if you go to the really high upper limits, your 40 keVs, 50 keVs, then yeah, there is starting to be a noticeable divergence between relativity and non-relativistic physics, but for the most part, it's not like crazy relativistic. Now let's go out farther on the plot, look farther to the right, and what you see is that the Schrodinger equation makes a very interesting prediction. It says that if you put 255.5 keVs into an electron, you can accelerate it to the speed of light. Well, wait a minute, but you can buy things off of eBay to make 255 keV electrons, right? Like that's not at all inaccessible to modern technology. Uh, you know, in fact, your average hobbyist can make electrons on the order of MeVs, right? I mean, it's not that hard to like get a high voltage and a vacuum tube and electron, like you can do these things. So why is it that we haven't accelerated electrons faster than the speed of light? 
And the reason is that relativity makes a very clear prediction, which is that there is a vertical asymptote on this chart. So you can never get to the speed of light because the energy goes up and up and up and it vertically asymptotes. So why is it that the relativistic curve blows up and has that vertical asymptote? Well, it's time to get mathematical. So you've noticed that I've labeled these curves Einstein and Newton. That's of course just shorthand for relativistic and non-relativistic. And the reason I put Newton and not Schrodinger is that even though the Schrodinger equation is wavy and quantum mechanical, for the purposes of looking at energy versus velocity, really Schrodinger and Newton are the same in the sense that the Schrodinger equation was derived from the classical energy momentum mass relationship, which is that the kinetic energy is P squared over 2m. And remember, you can derive that from the fact that kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, and momentum is mv, so, you know, rearrange that and you get kinetic energy is p squared over 2m, and when there's no potential, when you have a free particle, then the energy of the particle is just its kinetic energy. Okay, and so the classical equation, it goes up, it's quadratic, but it doesn't vertically asymptote, so in theory, Newtonian physics doesn't stop you from going faster than the speed of light, but relativity does. Why? See, in relativity, the mass of a particle is to space-time what its energy is to time and its momentum is to space. Uh, we'll unpack that idea much more thoroughly in future videos. But anyway, the consequence of that for today is that in relativity, you end up with the energy-momentum-mass relation that E squared equals PC quantity squared plus MC squared quantity squared. And so if you want to imagine a right triangle where the hypotenuse is the energy, then one of the sides is mc squared and the other side is pc, meaning momentum times the speed of light. But now, okay, you might think, well, if momentum is just mass times velocity, then at the speed of light, the momentum is just the particle's mass times the speed of light. That's still a finite value. So how do we get this vertical asymptote in the energy versus velocity equation? And the reason being that in relativity, you have time dilation as well. So as the particle approaches the speed of light, in the frame of the laboratory, we see the particle's clock ticking more and more slowly. By clock ticking more slowly, I just mean any oscillating thing, any oscillating pattern. And what this ends up doing is if you measure the particle's velocity as the distance it covers per its own unit of time, that is what some people call the proper velocity, and you put that into the momentum equation, then you end up seeing that the momentum in relativity is not m times v. It's gamma m times v, where gamma is the Lorentz factor that diverges as the velocity approaches the speed of light. And in particular, gamma is root 1 over 1 minus beta squared, where beta is that velocity factor that I'm showing on this chart. And so as you can see, when beta approaches 1, the denominator approaches 0, and the whole darn thing blows up because you're not supposed to divide by 0. So now you might be wondering, is this really true? Has it really been shown that there is this vertical asymptote in the energy as a function of velocity? And you know, that's what particle accelerators are all about, is accelerating particles to super, super, ultra-relativistic speeds. And indeed, you, you do find that this energy-velocity relationship holds, at least up to energies that have been tested so far, and people have tested some pretty high energies. So just for a sense of perspective, the fastest electron ever accelerated by CERN's Large Electron-Positron Collider was over 100 GeVs, that's giga-electron volts, that's over a hundred million keVs. So what, is this particle traveling like uh, half a million times faster than the speed of light? No, actually its speed was 0 0.9999999998988 times the speed of light. Okay, saying that number makes me feel like a stubborn German. And of course that's exactly what we expect from the relativistic curve. And you know, sometimes people wonder, how do we really know you can't go faster than the speed of light? And people imagine, like, we've never built a spaceship that goes that fast, so how do we really know? But the answer is, we've pushed, we being humanity, have pushed really, really, really hard on tiny, tiny, tiny things, and have really pushed them right up against that light speed barrier with forces that you just wouldn't believe. And it really is a strong barrier. So if you want to go faster than the speed of light, you can't get there just by pushing matter. It just doesn't work. So now that we've seen that a particle's energy just goes crazy as you approach the speed of light, we can go back and take a look at the form of the Schrodinger plane wave, and we can see that built into the solution of the Schrodinger plane wave, baked into the cake, is this idea that energy has to be momentum squared divided by twice the mass. And you can see that that's the case because if you look at the term that's multiplying by time, where you expect to see energy, we see p squared over 2m, 
In the Schrodinger picture, it's Newtonian, it's all good, that makes sense, but in the relativistic picture, the equation doesn't make sense when the energy deviates from that p squared over 2m equation, as we've just seen. So we need to find a different equation. We need to find a relativistic wave equation, where the basic requirement should be that the energy and momentum and mass are related not as E equals p squared over 2m for a free particle, but in accordance with the relativistic energy momentum mass equation. And we're going to talk in the next video about how we can do that. We'll start off with the Klein-Gordon equation, and we'll see how we can derive a relativistic wave equation, we'll look at some of the problems with it, and then that'll lead into the development of the Dirac equation. But anyway, for today I just wanted to show you what a Schrodinger plane wave is, show you that it's representative of general solutions for a Schrodinger free particle, and I wanted to show you how much the relativistic equation deviates from the classical equation as we approach the speed of light, and then I finally just wanted to tie that back in to looking at, again, the form of the Schrodinger wave equation and seeing that built into this equation is the classical energy-momentum relation, and so it doesn't really work. And also, when you look at this equation, the Schrodinger plane wave, that is, it's very interesting. Uh, it foreshadows relativistic quantum mechanics in the sense that you do see this connection between momentum and space and energy and time, which again is a reflection of the momentum and energy operators. But in the plane waves, you see a pretty pure distillation of that, where the momentum is dot producted with the position vector and the energy is multiplied by time. But the problem is, in the energy, the momentum is squared and the mass is in the wrong place and the mass doesn't play its proper role as the space-time interval analog. And it's like this whole thing where it's almost there, but it's not quite right. And the relativistic upgrades that we're going to do to the Schrodinger equation in the upcoming videos are going to really straighten that out for us philosophically and not only lead to more accurate predictions, but really show us the true nature of momentum and energy and mass and all of that. So that'll be really exciting and looking forward to it, and I hope you are as well.